Well, good afternoon to everybody. Um, my name is Joe Shaw and I'm convening this, which is the sixth of our Global SIT webinars. And the topic today is citizenship, inequality and uh, justice. And as we explained in the uh, specification for the webinar, which was presumably what attracted you to um, come here today and to, um, to which you're very welcome, um, we felt that it was a good opportunity to look at the ideals of equal citizenship and equality of citizens, because although e equality is so often um, invoked in relation to uh, citizenship, uh, in practice, uh, we perhaps mean quite different things when we use this concept from a variety of different perspectives, uh, disciplinary perspectives, also different national backgrounds, uh, different um, backgrounds uh, from um, the perspective of how we experience citizenship. Uh, and so perhaps we thought it would be useful to, to look at, at how uh, equality has been used by different scholars of citizenship, how they understand the role of equality in relation to citizenship, and to look also at what might be some challenges or threats that may be faced by citizenship uh, that may be relevant to the question of equality. For example, when we look at how constitutions uh, define citizenship. I'm going to briefly introduce the, the four uh, speakers on this roundtable format webinar. Um, and then I'm going to ask them to, um, to answer some questions, which I hope are reasonably open questions. And I hope that perhaps they might also uh, react to what each other is saying. And then at the end of that, there'll be plenty of time uh, for questions, which as usual with our uh, Global SIP webinars, uh, we would invite you to uh, place these in the Q and A, and I will pass them on to the speakers um, and uh, direct them um, as appropriate. It's helpful, of course, if you say, uh, if your question is directed to one specific person or is directed to the speakers in general. So briefly, just to introduce the, the speakers, the first speaker on our first round will be uh, Christine Hobden. Dr. Christine Hobden is a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Fort Hare and an ISO Lomzo fellow at the Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Study. And I think we're all very excited about her forthcoming book with Routledge, Citizenship in a Globalized um, World, um, which will be available in uh, May, 2021. And Christine recently contributed a number of things to, to Global SIT, including um, uh, a, a contribution to our forum on uh, decentralizing naturalization and citizenship acquisition in the Global South. Then we have uh, Dr. Tamar Hon Han uh, Hostovsky Brandes, my apologies, Tamar, uh, who's a senior lecturer at Ono Ak Academic College's Faculty of Law in Israel. Uh, who has JSD and an, an LLM from Columbia, where she was uh, Columbia uh, Law School, where she was a Finkelstein uh, fellow. Uh, she's a, written extensively on uh, citizenship, um, including um, she's written around issues around uh, Israel's nation state law and what that means for equality, self-determination and social solidarity. Our third speaker in that round will be uh, Professor David Owen, who's a professor of social and political philosophy at the University of Southampton. His research engages with citizenship, migration and refugees and published, he published a very well uh, received book in 2020, What Do We Owe to Refugees? Finally, Rachel um, Pugne, uh, Pugne uh, Dr. Rachel Pugne is a senior research associate who's an ESRC postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bristol Law School. She was awarded her PhD in 2020, looking at uh, citizenship, national security and state-led policies concerning inclusion and exclusion. And she focuses particularly on France and the UK. So I'm going to turn first to uh, Christine with the question um, as follows, and, and they have had um, prior notice of these questions. They're not going to be horribly surprised. Well, I hope they aren't. Um, so the first question is, it's often said that equality is a central concept when you, we try to understand citizenship, but equality like citizenship is a concept which can be used in so many different ways. Can you briefly explain what role equality has played um, as a principle in the research that you've done on citizenship. Christine. Great, thanks. Thanks, Joe. 
So we're going to start with the, the theoretical. Um, what I've been trying to do in my recent work on citizenship is to think through what a plausible normative justification for state-based citizenship can be, and then what living that citizenship justly would look like. So while my thoughts do have some things to say about migration and boundaries of citizenship, it focuses mostly on kind of the vast majority of people who live within the states that they were born in, but at the same time, they do that in a context of a very deeply interconnected and deeply unjust, in many cases, global context. So I'm going to present some of these ideas, which are kind of normative and sometimes quite aspirational, but also try to take real world circumstances quite seriously. So with that in mind, I think equality plays two main roles for me in my thinking. Um, the first of which is as a foundational principle for what I think can help us to justify a state-based citizenship. And the second is when it comes to inequality, it plays quite an important role in shaping how I think the typical citizen should live their citizenship day to day if they're trying to do so justly. But for now, I'm gonna focus on this foundational role that equality um, plays um, because I think uh, political equality especially is something that we need to try and maintain in our accounts of citizenship. So I think for now we have a system of a, a world of states and that's something that we are living with for the foreseeable future. And so my strategy is to try to develop a plausible justification for that and then to use that justification to have the normative resources um, to argue for what actually it would look like to live citizenship in that world justly. So I start from a cosmopolitan simple premise that I think most people are willing to agree to, that all persons are of equal moral worth. Then I say, if all persons are of equal moral worth, um, I argue that that grounds at least two duties. Um, the duty to provide for each other the basic goods that we need to live that life, the basic human necessities. And importantly, it also grounds what we need to be able to live as equals. And I think it's plausible that the state could be seen as a good vehicle to achieve this end for us. For a particular set of individuals, through the provision and protection of basic rights, and the creation of a political system where individuals can participate as equals in the rules that govern them. So on my view, citizenship is something like the participation in a practice alongside a group of others um, in a particular location, trying to fulfill this end of equal moral worth for, for each other. So for yourself and for the others around you. And I think importantly on this view, um, states are equal projects, um, all together participating, trying to achieve this one global aim of ensuring the basic um, equal moral worth of, of persons. So the state is always then one project among many, and that's something that I argue citizens need to take cognizance of. It means that the state can't pursue its own ends at the cost of undermining another state trying to do the same. And of course, this has quite a lot of implications for, for citizenship and for international relations, which I won't have time to go, go into now. But I think for now we can note that it sets up a citizenship that values domestic political equality, but also grounds outward looking responsibility for citizens, um, both towards other states and persons. And it does so for, for states and citizens and those come together often in, in my view. Importantly also for, for the migration folk, I think it can ground a conception of citizenship that allows movement between different projects of the state um, and can allow for a dual citizenship. So like many would hold, citizenship is foundationally a status that protects certain basic rights equally for all citizens. But equality is also more central in a robust way on my view. Um, a democratic state can create the space required for political equality and 
the ability for people then to live a life as equals, to not be dominated by those around them. And from a theoretical perspective, I think that this is the great thing that citizenship can offer us and that we should um, pursue. The theory also, I think, gives us the tool to identify and analyze the ways that these, these fails. And I'm, I'm gonna wrap up in, in a second. So I think we get the, the aspiration of what we should be arguing for, but also the tools to identify that violations of rights against particular groups, for example, is not just about the violations of the rights, but also the violations of the relational equality between citizens. Just a final note that I won't go into, but I think might become relevant, is that my view of citizenship is collective. So it's grounded on equality of persons. It seeks to fully respect equality of persons, but it argues that that can only be done together. And, and that's gonna have implications for, for what it means to live citizenship and the responsibilities we, we might have. Um, but I'll stop there and uh, you can follow up as, as you'd like. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn now to uh, Tamar, uh, who's going to give us her answer to, to that hopefully slightly provocative question. I'm afraid you're still unmuted. I unmuted myself several times. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, so the context in which I've mostly worked on these questions of citizenship and equality is a domestic local context of Israel. And this is the setting in which I've looked at these questions. And in Israel, in this context, the triangular relationship between nationality in the sense of national identity and citizenship and equality is very central and important in the context of what is the meaning for equality for the definition of Israel as a Jewish state. Now, the way um, the Israeli public discourse and Israeli law and Israeli Supreme Court have um, addressed this question has been through creating a distinction between citizenship which is perceived and viewed as a formal status to which rights and duties are attached, and nationality in the broad sense of belonging to a political community with shared value, with shared solidarity, with kind of a broader idea and more robust idea of membership. And what, since the court has been very persistent about the fact that Israel's definition as a Jewish state cannot be interpreted as a license to discriminate, what the legal framework that's been, or kind of the way that this, um, this, this issue has been framed is to create a very strict distinction between questions or issues of individual equality and making it very clear that individual equality, that all citizens are equal in the sense of individual equality, but characterizing other issues, issues of collective rights, of group rights, of cultural rights, as something, as separate issues that do not come within the realm of, of individual rights, but also that are not character, characterized at all as questions of equality. So claims for um, collect recognition of groups and cultural recognition are framed not as issues of equality, I think partly because it would be, then there would be an alleged um, contradiction between the definition of Israel as a Jewish state and equality. And since you know the, the, the claim, the perception is that there is no such contradiction, all of these collective issues of belonging and membership in the, in the political community cannot be characterized um, as questions or issues of equality. Now, I think that the, the characterization or the discussion or the discourse about group rights not in the context of equality per se, is not unique to Israel. A lot of the writing and the scholarship about multiculturalism and group rights talks about accommodation and about things that are not equality per se. But I also think that the Israeli case study um, makes it very clear that this very clear cut distinction 
it's very difficult to maintain because the, the because the, these two they in, they interact with each other so you can't really say it doesn't you can't really uphold this distinction between citizenship and a formal status and nationality or belonging to the political community what and at the same time saying or believing or arguing that it has no implications for individual equality you can't classify collective rights or group rights as something that belongs to another realm and say, yeah, we can discuss that, but we can completely separate it and distinguish it and say it has nothing to do with individual equality. It's not discrimination. The equality is just about um, discrimination because equality is a more complex concept. And being an equally equal and, and being a true member, that was the, the word I was thinking, being a true member of the political community in a robust sense, not just in a formal sense, is also an aspect of equality. And I think these are questions and issues that we are Israel is struggling with today. And I think it's one of the questions and one of the central questions um, before the Israeli Supreme Court now with respect to basic law, Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. Um, the basic law defines Israel as um, uh, Jewish state and basically explicitly says, it's, it's unique in the sense that it explicitly states that the right to self-determination is uh, in Israel is, is uh, exclusive to the Jewish people. It has no recognition of minority rights, no recognition of group rights, no recognition of um, the Arab Palestinian minority in Israel at all. Um, and yet the supporters of the law still maintain that it doesn't violate equality in any sense and it has no real implication on individual rights. So whether you can even argue this, I think whether, where, where, how, how do you um, entangle this, this tension is a very relevant question or issue in Israel today. Thank you very much, Tamar. Um, so the third um, uh, commentator on this question will be David Owen. Unmute yourself, David. Thanks, uh, Joe. Um, so I'd like to just start by sort of distinguishing between citizenship as status and uh, citizenship as praxis, or between status citizenship and, and civic agency. And I do that because I, I take the second citizenship as praxis to be more fundamental in that it encompasses the construction and transformation of status citizenships, or indeed of the polities that make up uh, status citizenship. And also because those who, as it were, may be exercising civic agency is not limited to those who are status citizens. Okay, the second reason I kind of want to make that distinction more saliently for our discussion is that I think that different conceptions of equality are in play with respect to status citizenship and, as it were, agency citizenship. Um, so I take the fundamental objection to inequality with respect to status citizenship to be the objection to domination. So the relevant sense of, uh, of equality in play there is, is one of non-domination or the avoidance of uh, domination. So the ideal expressed in status citizenship is that of being at liberty, as you know the Romans uh, tell us, you know, to enjoy a civil rights and duties that compose the office of citizenship and the opportunity to participate as a political equal in determining the laws to which they're subjects. Or to put it another way, I might say that status citizenship aims to provide robust conditions of claim making. So in a world of states, enjoyment of status citizenship in some state is a fundamental enabling condition of having an effective right to claim rights to, as it were, adapt a rent. By contrast, uh, if we think about agency citizenship, it's not liberty and domination, which is at the forefront, but freedom and power. So here the issue is of the 
exercise of the ability to act in concert with others to resist, sustain, or transform the ways in which you're governed. So equality here is manifest in freedoms of and in participation with others on equal terms. Okay. Now, most of my work on citizenship, on issues of statelessness and migration and refugees has been focused on status citizenship and hence on issues of domination. So, for example, I've been concerned with the ways in which the operation of hierarchically ordered civic statuses, okay, from citizen to temporary resident to refugee to stateless person within states may enable forms of domination and how the qualified unilateral power of states to create and determine diverse civic statuses, such as those just mentioned, uh, itself enacts a form of domination. But I'm also interested in the way in which status citizenship in a global context can be seen to reveal a hierarchical ordering of state citizenships in terms of access to rights and to mobility. Both of these connect to the opportunities and challenges raised by what we might call the contemporary transnationalization of the state seen in phenomena such as expatriate voting rights, the rise of dual nationality, and the rise, slower rise of resident non-citizen voting rights, as well as in the growth of supranational regional forms of civil association that may offer new forms of protection against new forms of domination, but that also enable new avenues of agency citizenship, or at least lower the costs of civic activity. So, so all I kind of really want to say here is that the relevant conception of equality in play will differ as to which conception or which aspect, if you prefer, uh, of citizenship one is um, concerned with. And hence, it is, in my view, kind of like Im important to clarify what the value of equality is under those different conditions and what the objections to inequality are. And that will vary across those things in my view. Stop there. Thank you very much. Um, now, finally, but by no means least, uh, Rachel uh, will be the final speaker in this round. Well, thank you. Um, so just like all of the other speakers, um, equality has played a central role in my research, because one of the things that I've been looking at over the last few years is um, citizenship deprivation on grounds of counterterrorism and in the context of France and the UK. And as I'm sure many of you uh, know, citizenship deprivation is in direct tension with equal citizenship, and especially with formal equality. It's in direct tension with formal equality because the laws and practices of France in the UK, they primarily target individuals who have acquired citizenship after birth and or individuals who hold multiple nationalities. And, and so in essence, they make distinctions uh, within the, 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 the citizenship body um, according to the degree of foreignness of the individuals. And an equality, the principle of equality has played, um, I would say, a paradoxical role in the evolution of the powers. Um, so for example, at the beginning of the 20th century, both France and the UK, they included um, temporal restrictions on the exercise of their powers. So the idea was that, um, so in the UK, for example, naturalized citizens who had acquired citizenship for less than five years, and who had committed a crime could be deprived of their citizenship. But after five years, they were immune from the exercise of these powers. And there was a similar-ish provision in France and the, the, the time span was, was 10 years. But so, so in essence, the idea was that um, na recently naturalized citizens were put under, let's say, um, temporary um, internship of Frenchness and Britishness. And after this, they were completely immune. And the argument behind this immunity was an argument of grounded in equal citizenship. But what we've witnessed is that uh, post 9-11 in the counterterrorism context, both from the, France and the UK, they've tried to completely get rid of this 
um, time span or time limit. And they've also tried to expand citizenship deprivation to birthright citizens. And, and the argument here was that the nature of the threat to terrorism um, should not uh, justify a distinction that would be based on the route to citizenship of these individuals. So in essence, it was um, an extreme example of formal equality, um, uh, which is which is being used as a way to like level down the, the, the protection which is granted to all citizens. And, and so the, the provision went through in the UK in 2002, but it failed in France in 2015. But in the UK, the government still introduced some um, a safeguard against statelessness, which means that even if the government could make birthright citizens um, as well as natural citizens, um, even if it could deprive them of their citizenship, um, it couldn't apply the powers to multiple nationality holders, again, in order to safeguard statelessness. But what we've seen is that uh, the UK has a very extensive, uh, I think that's the least I can say, interpretation of what holding another uh, citizenship means. And, and, I've, and, and we've seen that was the case of Shamima Begum, where basically they, the, the government assumes that um, individuals who have no connection whatsoever to this other state other than their foreign heritage can still claim this second citizenship and are still considered multiple nationality holders. And, and I think overall, um, we need to be very wary of these um, formal, formal equality kind of argument which downplays the level of protection of the whole, the entire citizenry. And one of the reasons is obviously because the, the powers are still in practice uh, being applied to naturalized citizens or multiple nationality holders. And it's also because these powers are uh, very often supported by um, populist discourses about belonging, who belongs, what is required to belong, and et cetera. And they're also very often mixed with discourses on integration, which are discourses which primarily target uh, individuals with migrant ancestries. So what the, the, the conjunct effect of these two practices do is that basically it it taps into the feelings um, of the population that there are some citizens whom it's legitimate to suspect, and that there are some citizens who are under like um, heightened expectations of conduct, and that there are some citizens who are exposed to a double sanctioning from the state. So in other words, what they risk doing is um, legalizing, racializing inequalities, which are already deeply embedded in French and UK societies. I think I will stop here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you to all four of you for being so brisk in your um, in, in your initial uh, statements and, and for illuminating so many different aspects of citizenship. And we could have made this, of course, uh, an even bigger conversation if we'd included even more people, but then it would have become unmanageable. Uh, so we're going to turn to a second round of questions. And, and in that context, I might warn the two people who are coming first um, that, that um, Rainer Bauberg has already placed some questions for them, um, uh, for them into the, um, uh, uh, into the, um, uh, the Q&A box to uh, Christine and to, to, to David. But don't, don't try and answer those now. You, you'll get an opportunity to, uh, to dialogue with, uh, with Rainer, as it were. Or to get your have your say in relation to Reiner uh, when when it comes to the Q and A, but I thought I'd draw your attention to this, David. You're going to go go first on this uh, second round of questions, where I, I just want to um, uh, take the opportunity to push you a little bit more on on the. Uh, and I, I know you're a political theorist, but you're a political theorist like uh, Christine as well, with an interest in in real world conditions as well. Um, and I just want to push you a little bit on on the question of. Uh, what sorts of tools you uh, uh, see, whether or not you could see, um, I mean, I, I recognize that you, you, you could see some, some limitations in, in the concept of equality. And does that mean therefore that it's so, as it were, irreducibly uncertain that, that you don't see that it provides any, any tools that, um, that might allow us to, to make the types of, of distinctions or or alternatively, the types perhaps of, of leveling up that would be consistent with your um, arguments around, for example, non-domination, non the issue of domination. Okay, so 
So um, my, my, my point is actually that the, the concept of equality, um, you know, has a lot of analytical purchase. It's just we have several conceptions of equality, um, mm -hmm. which may be differentially relevant to different problems that we're addressing. So, so I was saying, you know, I take citizenship to be most fundamentally about non non domination, and I think Christine uh, also indicated, uh, you know, uh, in that a, a stance of, of that kind. But of course, that's not the only sense of equality that's kind of relevant to, you know, our political lives. Um, so. You know, I mean, there's obviously issues about sort of procedural equalities. There's issues around equality of opportunity. There's all sorts of, you know, other debates around equality, some of which may not be, you know, straightforwardly linked to kind of the issue of non-domination. Non okay. So all I want to kind of do at the sort of abstract level is sort of make a plea for, you know, distinguishing relevant conceptions of equality. At a kind of more concrete level, if this is the, the tools question, I mean, I think kind of Rachel gave us a really nice example of how the notion of equality can get kind of real purchase um, uh, in contexts where it's under threat, like that of, of citizenship uh, deprivation. But I do think that they're also, you know, one way of looking at, you know, something like dual nationality is to say, well, look, here's somebody whose life occupies more than one state space, but they're open to kind of potential threats of domination in both spaces. Okay, so dual nationality is one is a kind of response to that. So again, you know, when people raise the question about is dual nationality um, you know, equal because, hey, I've only got one nationality and you've got two. Well, that depends on the context of our, our lives, basically, mm -hmm. and our, you know, connections and the potential sources of domination to which we are subject. So equality qua non-domination may legitimate me having one nationality and you having two, okay? And it's important to, you know, play those out. I mean, I... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm kind of fully going with the question here. So uh... maybe I could just also uh, push you a little bit on on one aspect of your work that I I found really interesting, which was the question about equality of states in relation to questions of citizenship. Where I found that that your your application there of a well your your critique there, if you will, of a of a, a notion of equal Westphalian states. Uh, or unequal Westphalian states, perhaps more yeah. pertinently. Um, sorry, uh, was was um, was a really helpful tool to 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 try to uh, get get to the bottom of what citizenship might mean, not just as it were within states, but also across between states. Yeah, I mean, okay, thanks. So that 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 help helps me. I mean, so so we obviously kind of live in a grossly unequal world and the kind of unequal quality of citizenship uh, both looked at internationally and looked at you know kind of in terms of domestic com compa comparisons um, in the world is embedded within that wider range of inequalities many of them inherited from previous imperial um, times so one kind of question to focus this would be to say well look Suppose we had a nice liberal nationalist world of equal states in which, you know, there were equal citizens. Would that be sufficient for global justice? You know, would that would that be uh, a just world? And and I want to say, well, no, it wouldn't be. Um, it wouldn't be because, first of all, you know, the right to leave your state um, you know, in, in that liberal nationalist world, basically, uh, as only a right not to be prevented from leaving, but not a right to sort of enter anywhere else, leaves you kind of completely exposed to the arbitrary decision making of other 
states. It le leads, as it were, to the international state system being the dominator rather than your own state being uh, the dominator. So I think at least some, if you like, if I go razzy and some adequate range of valuable movement options should be available um, uh, to you. So that's one point. Second reason it's not adequate is that I think that uh, the members of the world who are subject to this sort of global uh, state regime um, should have the power to transform it, that they should have the ability to transform the political order of the globe to which they are, are subject. So um, we need not only to be concerned about, you know, equality of states and, you know, ways of, of bringing states um, into more equal relations. But in doing so, and as in extending beyond states to kind of issues of transnational citizenship and regional citizenship, we're also kind of building the basis on which, as it were, citizens can, uh, people can engage in forms of civic practice, which are capable of, as it were, transforming political structures more, more generally. Um, so that's, I, I guess, the kind of response that I would give. I'm sure Rhino will have things to say about it. Well, as I say, both, both you, David, and Christine have already got some lengthy and interesting questions from Rhino in the, um, in the Q&A. Others should not feel um, in any way put off from putting other questions into the Q&A. Please do enrich our debate by, by asking us questions if, if if uh, uh, directed either to the whole panel or perhaps preferably to one or more individuals. So I'm going to turn to Christine now and, and ask her also a little bit more. Um, she talked in relatively general terms about issues of um, political equality, if you will, um, and, uh, in, a, in a sort of a, a broader context um, as, a, 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 as a foundational ideal. And, and teased us also that she was interested in questions around, around justice. Um, so um, can, you, can you amplify a little bit more what some of the practical implications might be for your uh, theories of, of the political equality of citizens, particularly in the context of work perhaps on the on the global south where where you've um you've been working on south africa and doubtless you've also taken an interest in some of the other um some some other states where uh, naturalization for example as as you wrote in your uh, contribution to our global sit forum where naturalization is by no means uh, such a, a common practice as, as it is in, in many states in the global north. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you would uh, think about uh, some of the tools to instrumentalize some of your, uh, some of the more, and I don't use this in a negative sense, some of the more abstract um, and, and very interesting points that you made in your first contribution. Sure. Um, so yeah, I think I might not be able to get to something you would call a tool, um, thinking through political uh, equality, or particularly in, in places, as you know, that are so um, kind of deeply unequal in, in many respects. Um, but I think the first thing that we get when we focus on uh, political equality, and again, it's quite an abstract concept, but what I'm interested in is trying to shift the perspective of citizens, of how we think about ourselves as citizens, um, as a first step to then informing how we might act on trying to change the institutions and, and the society in, in which we have. And something I've been thinking a bit about lately um, with respect to this is I think a focus on citizenship um, as, as something that we do together and as relational equality as being very important changes our perspective when it comes to some kind of national issues to a question of, um, or at least it needs to bring in the question of what do we owe to each other um, as the first foundational question and the question of what we're gonna get the state to do to help us implement that, that and fulfill that and enforce that is, is a secondary question. Um, and I think in states where um, people do often feel dominated by the state, 
um, and by certain parts of, of the community in the state, that can be quite an important shift. So I notice citizens often thinking purely about the relationship between themselves and the state as the, the first political question they need to, to be dealing with. So I think one tool can be this reorientation um, and equality helps us to, to push for that um, a little bit. Do you want to follow up or should I continue? <laughs> Sorry, I, I forgot to. No, I was just making a note of something, um, but um, okay, sure. you, you still got a few comments to make in this section yet? Or did you finish? Sure, I think I could I could say one more thing. Um, yeah, if, please if we do. Have space for it. So I kind of wanted, in a way, it's a response to, to your question, but I, I also, found a really interesting listen, listening to what uh, David had to say about your question about equality um, of states and the hierarchies that come up when we have kind of deeply unequal states in, in the world order. Um, and I completely uh, agree, and this starts a little bit to answer Reiner's question as well, but we'll go, go back to that, that it's not just enough to have just independent states. There's something really important about how those states interact with each other. So I think another tool that really is useful from, from how I think about equality right from the very start is that it also includes the idea that states have to be considered as, as equals. Um, and we know that in practice, that's not a, a reality. It's a very performative commitment to equality on the global stage. Um, but my strategy, whether it's uh, going to be effective or not, is to try to leverage that performative commitment. So if states want to claim to be equal sovereigns, we can keep outlining what that might entail. Um, and I think as um, having that as a background to one's citizenship also gives tools to, to citizens and states that are often marginalized in the, the global scheme of things to be able to, to push further um, for what equality really means, um, because as has been pointed out, kind of equal citizenship in your state when you're being dominated by another state or another system loses a lot of its um, its weight and, and value. Okay, I think I'll stop. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. The the, the third uh, contributor on this question um, is Rachel. Um, and, and Rachel, I, I, I wondered if you um, you would be open to the suggestion that that it isn't always equality that is um, is the defining concept here. It's perhaps also questions about about precarity and possibly also about solidarity. So the the lack of solidarity, if you will, which is a, a concept that Tamara has used a great deal in in her work. A lack of solidarity that enables um, governments, if you will, to practice the types of divide and rule policy that you were um, broadly um, adverting to in, in your in your first response. Um, yeah, I think I think that's uh, that's definitely a great a, a good way to put it. But then that still means that um, basically the state sees different citizens. Differently, the state just assumes that there's some citizens who are who are under um, different expectations of uh, conduct, or who are under different levels of 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 sanctioning. So, and 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 I think that's especially in the French case, that's um, that's the, this kind of universal uniformity of the the citizen body and the solidarity between between all of the citizens and etc. Is, is very much a, a myth that has been uh, contradicted empirically, uh, empirically and, and historically and, and etc. And um, I think one of the ways to see how this kind of like relationship of, of, of equality and justice and fairness and citizenship deprivation plays out is to look at how um, the courts have approached it. Because if you think about France and the UK, they have you know, very important um, um, frameworks that protect uh, justice, solidarity, equality, and etc. But but what 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 we we see is that the courts have um, in France and the UK they very much struggled to uphold these principles in the context of citizenship deprivation. And what they've been doing a lot is to um, defer 
and, and, and exercise like judicial restraint in, in a sense that they've granted a lot of leeway to the executive to, to, to act. And I might be actually taking a tangent here because I'm not sure I'm answering your question anymore. Um, but if I'm, I'm still going to carry on anyway, if that's fine. And um, so, and, and there's, there's a couple of, of, of uh, reasons for this. So one of, one of the primary reasons is that we're dealing here with a, a measure that links with national security. And national security is an area where the state enjoys broad discretion. The other reason is that we're dealing with citizenship and, and the state still enjoys some um, important discretion in, in setting out the contours of their um, political body of their citizenry. And the other thing is that citizenship in France and the UK is not defined by law, other than through the modes of, acqui of acquisition of citizenship and the modes of loss. So it's very difficult for the judges to know what is it that the individuals lose when they lose their citizenship. So they, they're very much going into uncharted territories and they have to kind of draw on um, socio-historical images of citizenship and etc. And what they've been doing uh, the, one of the effects of deference and, and judicial restraint in these areas is that the courts have accepted the idea that the state had a separate claim to, um, to sanction the breach of allegiance of the individual with regards to the state. So they've accepted that citizenship deprivation could be used as a duty to sanction allegiance or lack of lo loyalty, even when the individuals are not assessed to be a threat to the state anymore. And, and here too, there's very little ground, legal grounding for this. So loyalty, allegiance, and et cetera, legally they are dealt with um, treason laws, but not citizenship deprivation. And, and they're kind of reviving either images of citizenship that were, that were present uh, during the, the inter, interwar period when France and the UK were colonial empires and et cetera. And there's very little to, to, to be gained from reviving these images. And, and, and in the French context, the way that they've, the, the courts have kind of tried to justify this breach of allegiance was to say that citizenship deprivation, in essence, um, reversed the effect of naturalization. So they, you know, the, the individuals came into to, to the country and, and, and it was, um, um, yeah, well, I don't know, maybe I'm going to stop here. I don't know if you, yeah. Yeah, that, that's fascinating stuff and it's terribly relevant, but I'm also awfully conscious of time and, and looking at the fact that we've got one more person and then a whole other question where people are going to have to stay very brief. Uh, Tamar, your, your reflections on issues around um, the further reflections on, on citizenship uh, and equality. I wonder if I could push you a little bit and just to draw your attention to the fact that you've also got, got a question um, in the box already to be thinking about. Um, just to push you a little bit on the question of um, religious accommodation, if you will, because I wondered to what extent uh, you regard the uh, Israeli situation as a sort of a special case, um, or whether you could think about any parallels between um, how, how, how some of those questions are, are, are dealt with in Israel and say um, the, 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 the vigorous secularist approach that is, about, that is uh, ostensibly at the root of, say, the, 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 the connection that's been drawn in the law in France between the wearing of the burqa and, and citizenship status. If you don't have views on that issue, that's fine. Oh, I um, actually but I agree that my notes says veil. So I was actually about <laughs> to give that example the, the, that I just scribbled. Um, and it, we didn't coordinate it. <laughs> um, so yes. Um, so I'm going to go to the tools. And then I'm going to actually connect it. Because I wrote to myself, European Court of Human Rights veil cases. And I do want to bring the, the things together. Um, when, you, when, you, when you started talking about tools, the first thing that came to my mind that I, I'm a lawyer. So what I generally think about is what can and can't be achieved through the law. Okay, these are the, the tools that my dispense are the legal tools. And I think that if we're talking about the context of citizenship in the robust sense as membership in the political community, and we're talking about equality of citizenship in that robust sense, I think that um, law in general, in Israel also, but not only in Israel, has done a very poor job 
of addressing law and lawyers, of addressing um, equality in that sense. So isn't, so we talk about it basically, we use, we, we look at uh, equality through the lens of non-discrimination laws, but isn't being a member, isn't, isn't meaningful participation in the political community an aspect of equality being being allowed or having a meaning and an the ability to meaningfully participate in the political community an aspect of equality isn't recognition um, of a minority group an aspect of equality shouldn't the law address recognition as a question of equality um, should um, accommodation not be looked at as a question of equality now in Israel, but also outside of Israel, all of these issues are often framed as more political than legal. So these are things, recognition and accommodation are in many cases, not all, but in many situation views as things, especially when we're talking about the collective aspects of them, not individual aspects, but the collective aspects of them are viewed as things that should be fought for and, and, and achieved in the political sphere, but not necessarily in the legal sphere. The law can come in in the second phase, once we've already, once they've already been recognized in, um, in the political sphere. And I think that the law has a very um, hard time, and lawyers have a very hard time in characterizing these types of questions, questions of recognition, questions of cultural accommodations, questions of minority rights as questions of equality. And I think that lawyers have an even more difficult time when various aspects of equality contradict each other as the veil cases, I, I think is what happens as in, in, in the veil cases in the European Court of Human Rights. So the court is very confused in the sense that it's having a difficult time characterizing where the equality issue is. Is the equality issue with, is the equality issue at stake the prohibition to wear a veil? Or maybe the equality issue is that this entire practice is incompatible with equality? And how do we reconcile the, the individual aspects of equality with this kind of general principle of equality? And I think that the, we cannot talk the, 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 the tendency of lawyers to kind of look at this very narrow prism of status and equality attached to status does not enable us to accord equality or look at equality or, or understand or fully understand equality and its complexities. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to take an, an executive decision that we should turn really to the Q&A from the audience. And I'll, I'll come back if there's time with the third question that, that, that I had, um, um, uh, which, is, which is about whether or not you think that, um, uh, that the pandemic um, will um, make an, any, any real difference. I'll come back if there's, if there's time on this um, later on. But I, I do want to give um, give us a bit of time for some some of those questions that we've got. And I'm going to start with Reiner's question to to Christine, where he asked, um, "You've you've emphasised the domestic value of citizenship. What follows from um, from sorry? What follows from your approach for the assessment of of the birthright lottery from a global justice perspective? Is it fundamentally unjust to attribute to individuals at birth membership in a specific state?" without their choice, or is the un injustice reducible to globally unjust distribution of resources so that birthright attribution will be unproblematic in a world where demands of global social justice have been met? Christine. <clears throat> sure, thanks. Um, and, and thanks to, to Reiner for the, the great question. Um, so I take it the worry is in, in the global justice case is that where you born can end up being morally arbitrary. And the important point there being that it can have a substantive like impact on your, your life and your well-being and your, and your ability. So I am open, um, broadly speaking, to the idea that in an ideal world, states are not the correct uh, channel. Um, but the kind of theory I'm doing is starting from this position of states and, and seeing where we get. So setting aside the fact that maybe 
in the perfect ideal world, Ryan is right, or, or this position he's presenting, we just can't create justice with a birthright. I think there are some things we can do to, to get close to mitigating that, that worry. And we started to discuss them a, a little bit. So I do think that a big part of it comes down to unjust distribution of resources and the, the difficulty of moving between different states. And I think the interesting thing that, that David brought up as well is the inability to participate in changing some of the global structures that might be impacting on different individual states. So I do think in a world where there isn't such a vastly unjust distribution of resources between states, um, and under my account, state-based citizenship includes kind of outward looking duties that prevent you from harming other states, prevent you from undermining their practice, um, give you some positive duties to rescue them where they're completely failing to fulfill their, their ends, um, and allow citizens where they so wish to move between different practices and gain, gain membership, then I think we have much, much less worry about the kind of arbitrary fact that you're going to be born into one particular state over the other. I know. I'll see if he comes back back to me on that. Thanks. Well, quite likely. Um, so uh, rather than having two Rhino questions in one in one uh, one after the other, we'll, we'll move instead to uh, Mary Lise Jacobson's question, which is uh, really a question to Tamar, but it might bring David back as well. Um, Mary Lise Jacobson is, is very interested in hearing Tamar's views on David's remarks on the difference in status and its effects on praxis and also vice versa. And her question specifically is to what extent can denizenship be practiced in an ethnocracy like Israel? Can you still pursue a liberal citizenship project in a situation where you are not encouraged to follow a communitarian um, citizenship project as an ethnic minority member? I think that's a, actually an, an, an important question. It's maybe the central question um, in a slightly different version um, that I'm concerned with. And my short answer would be no. <laughs> my short answer would be that the communitarian project has to be redefined. Um, and the communitarian project has to be redefined in a way that it will encompass all citizens and allow for participations of all citizens in the um, in this in the communitarian project, I I don't have one view or one answer. I don't think there's only one answer or one model into what this communitarian project would look like. I think there are various communitarian models. I think some of them may include models of minority group rights, of recognition of group rights, of various complex relationship between minorities and minor minorities and majorities. But I think that the com the communitarian project, the joint project has to be one that encompasses all citizens and allows for participation of all citizens and allows them to strive to be part of the project. So yes, yeah, this is one of the challenges that I'm most, one of, the, that I'm, my, one of my central challenges, one of the things I'm, I engage with most often in my work. Okay. Um, yeah, um, just uh, yes, I was going to say, I, I'd invite David to come back and then perhaps um, I'll invite you to address Reiner's question. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I very much agree with what uh, Tamar just said, but I'd, I'd probably push it just one step further, and I don't know if she'd agree with this, that um, one part of, as it were, um, reconciling uh, the sort of liberal citizenship and the communitarian project um, might require a kind of transformation of, of the state. Um, you know, so uh, it might require, for example, uh, a, you know, dropping of the, the whole notion of kind of like two state solution in relationship to, to Israel and going for the sort of single state perhaps with federal uh, issues. In other words, I want to kind of suggest that in a context um, such as um, Israel, where there's such kind of deep ec economic um, uh, inter interrelation of um, the Palestinian territories with, with Israel, it may not just be a matter of 
uh, kind of including all citizens in the communitarian project, it may be a matter of, you know, thinking of all those who are kind of subject to various kinds of authority uh, and and rule. Um, and 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 then the question is, well, what forms could that take? And and then we get into arguments about, you know, what it, what it could take. But but it could involve kind of actually the transformation of the political entity, the political community, um, you know, itself, its form. Um, and you want to to address um, Reiner's question? I'll just read it so that everyone's got it, including those who haven't found the Q and A box. And there's still just to say there's still plenty of time for you to, to, to send your questions in. Um, state of citizenship presumably requires bounded political community in which individuals enjoy st the status. Is agency citizenship similarly bounded or is it inherently unbounded? Or does it, does it depend on the context of agency? Is agency citizenship maybe bounded um, to, the, to the object of agency in the sense of aiming to transform a particular bounded polity rather than being premised on membership status in such a polity? Or is there also a cosmopolitan agency citizenship that has no equivalent in global status citizenship? What we owe each other, perhaps. Yeah. No, um, so so um, although kind of in principle agency citizenship can be unbounded, um, agency citizenship is only kind of there at the point that it's actually manifest in exercise. It doesn't exist independently of 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 it of its exercise so in that sense it is uh, dependent on the context of agency and bounded with respect to the object of agency so let me just because that's a bit abstract let me just give an example okay so um which also helps illustrate something uh, uh, further about this so take indigenous peoples Okay, so indigenous peoples, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all over the place, Latin America, um, have been engaged in struggles to uh, be recognized as equal citizens of the state they're in, but also to problematize the kind of claims to sovereignty of the state they're in and to assert their own uh, sovereignty as political com communities. They have been doing that kind of collectively and often as in the, the the case of the US Canada border um, where you have communities that exist across the border um, in in ways that kind of you know raise issues about the legitimacy of that border of having part of the community on one side and part part of the community on the other so they've been engaged in those activities but they've also been engaged in an international network of these very groups exercising this agency to, to raise these questions, um, to operate at the international level, to try and get uh, back the recognition of uh, indigenous peoples in international law as having, you know, the kind of sovereign standing that enabled them to sign treaties 300 years uh, ago, for example. So these are examples of agency citizenship. These are kind of people dispersed across the world, engaged both in kind of local specific kind of transformations, but also in regional and global, you know, tran transform formations. So that just gives a sort of illustration, if you like, of the sort of thing that uh, I mean. And they constitute themselves as a community, as a, as it were, a sort of democratic community in and through that activity and that joint activity that they un undertake. Thank you. Um, so we've also got a question uh, from Martin Vink for Rachel. And, and before I ask Rachel that question, I, I would just say, um, want, want to say what, what tremendously, in, I thought, found your comments about um, the troubles with, with citizenship being experienced by French and and British courts around deprivation in the absence of any sort of definition. So they're filling that definition with other, with other concepts, allegiance. And it's a shame that we don't have anybody here who's willing to get up in the middle of the night from Australia and, and comment on the way in which allegiance and loyalty is being used 
um, in, in Australian uh, citizenship in sometimes quite problematic ways. Um, but, but also to, to think about um, other sort of constitutional concepts that, that judges could bring in to, to, to guide them in that way, and they, they haven't been doing that. But Martin is, Martin's got a, a, a sort of a, an, another interesting angle on this question, which is to ask you to compare two to to, uh, to cases. So she says, sorry, he says, the, we see the distinction between natural born citizens and naturalized citizens in many states, not only with regard to citizenship deprivation, but also with regard to high political office, such as the presidency in um, the US or Portugal. Clearly both violate the equality principle, but in different ways. Whereas inequality through deprivation points at status precarity, inequality in political rights points at democratic inclusion. Do you see these as similar or <clears throat> different issues of inequality? Um, you have a great question. Um, I would say that these are um, different issues of inequality in the sense that the, the, the critical difference between the two is the way in which state power is exercised on different kinds of citizens. And, and it's exercised in, in a way that's, that is kind of um, adding to um, already existing inequalities of like accessing rights and except for certain categories of, of the population. And it's, um, and, and it's exercised in a way that kind of revives um, images of, of, of citizenship during the empire. So this thing that the state could exercise powers differently on certain categories, categories of citizens. And to that extent, um, I think it, it, it's, it differs a, a, a little bit from um, <clears throat> the inequality in accessing these high stages, which is different from equality in accessing uh, political rights. I'm not sure my, my answer would be the same if, if it was um, restrictions on voting rights, for example. Um, but yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, th thank you very much, Rachel, and thanks to those who, who submitted questions. Um, uh, since we've given the, uh, the audience plenty of opportunity now to, to submit those questions, we'll come back, I think, to my third question to you, which was perhaps inevitably the, about the, the impact of the, the pandemic through which we are all in different ways living. And I, I wanted to ask you if you um, wanted to share any thoughts about whether or not the, the pandemic has exacerbated problems of inequality and injustice in relation to citizenship. I mean, there may be other problems which are not related to citizenship, but specifically citizenship. As regards um, uh, your, 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 the interest that you have on, the, on how citizenship and inequality uh, fit together, or do you see the, the current situation with the pandemic as being basically uh, business as usual? And perhaps I could invite uh, Tamar, um, who's sitting in the country, which has achieved the most um, uh, level of vaccine vaccination so far, um, to, to start uh, to, with, with a, a response to that question, um, which might of course raise the, 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 the issue of vaccinations for um, um, I don't want to put words into your mouth, vaccinations for, for Palestinians. Yeah, so um, I think the issue of vaccination, and, 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 and we can't talk about, there are a lot of aspects of the pandemics, uh, which bring us, bring up questions of citizenship and global justice, and what do we owe, to who do we owe what, um, but vaccinations at this point is the most urgent, um, urgent of them. And I think that the pandemic has in many respects both um, revealed both the still significance of formal citizenship and why, how, why formal citizenship matters, and in other senses revealed the weaknesses of formal citizenship in the case of Israel. And I think that the one arena where the um, strength of formal citizenship um, was revealed is in the context of Israel's responsibility to provide um, vaccine uh, to provide vaccines um, to Palestinians in the occupied territories. Where basically, there the the, the the statement is a very formal statement saying we don't we don't owe, we we have no um, obligations to Palestinians because we own this is an obligation that we are only owed to that we only owe to our citizenship. 
to our citizens. So here, and there, and everyone within citizens within, within Israel is entitled to vaccinate to vaccinations. And there are campaign within Israel to all parts of the population, um, and the, and the relevant group is the entire is everyone that holds a formal citizenship. But lack of formal citizenship has been used in this context as an argument for lack of responsibility. This is very, very, I think this is a very, very clear aspect, uh, clear, clear uh, case study, a clear example, that's what the words are looking, clear example of how formal citizenship is associated with responsibility and duties. And even though there's control, even though there are arguments for why there's no other country that can be responsible, even though there are arguments under international law and under IHL and other human rights law, still the citizenship card is kind of a card that trumps everything that says, no, this is a duty that is only ex owed, owed exclusively to citizenship and is not owed to anyone else. On completely other fronts, actually, although, which are less publicly available, pu publicly reported, I think the weaknesses of citizenship has also been um, exposed in Israel. And one front that is relevant today is the fact that um, there's the, the airport. Israel can only be entered through an airport. The airport is currently closed um, and citizens are not allowed to come back into the country, um, which means that there is a very large number of Israeli citizenship, citizens, formal citizens who are stuck outside of the outside of Israel and are not allowed in. And there's a committee, there's a humanitarian committee, but a lot, most of the um, of the applications are being denied. And there are quite a few situations in which Israeli citizens, for, here again, formal citizens, um, are currently outside of Israel, have become, I mean, illegal, are staying illegally in other countries because their visas has expired. Because, and even that has not been accepted by the state as um, a good enough reason, a sufficient reason for granting them an exemption from the general ban on entering Israel, and which is even though the basic law, basic law human dignity allow, it's a constitutional right of a citizen to enter a country, et cetera, et cetera. So on one hand, citizenship is used as a kind of very strong argument for why we don't owe duties to anyone who isn't a citizen, but on a completely other front, citizenship is not a very strong argument or is not strong enough um, for the very basic right of entering the country of your citizenship. And I think it's kind of reveals that it can be used, you know, in, in, in different ways. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, Rachel, um, uh, with your with your interest in these precarious statuses, has, has, um, has uh, how does that fit with the um, the issue of the impact of the pandemic in relation to um, <clears throat> citizenship? Well, there was, um, um, actually, there was a very timely case that just came out two weeks ago in the UK that kind of um, evidenced um, how the pandemic has worsened uh, what is, in essence, a already very uh, harsh, if not arbitrary, system in the UK. So um, the UK, what the UK government tends to do is to deprive individuals of their citizenship when they're outside of the country. So the idea is that you know, these individuals are a threat to the state. And so by removing the, them of their citizenship, you uh, mitigate that threat because you're precluding their returning to the country. You're exporting the threat, basically. But it also means that for individuals, um, it's very hard for them to actually reach out to the legal frameworks that are present in the state because of like complex um, issues of um, uh, of jurisdiction and because of issues of actually um, engaging or instructing their lawyers and and I think the Shamima Begum case was actually a very good example of the kind of difficulties that these individuals are exposed to. So the individual in this case is called P3, and he um, he's of uh, Iraqi heritage. He acquired citizenship in the 1990s. And he was deprived of his citizenship in 2017, whilst he was in Iraq, on the ground that he was um, he had links with Iranian um, um, security surveillance services. And so, whilst he was in Iran, in, in Iraq, sorry, he was trying to um, he he launched a claim to go back to the UK and and to conduct his appeal from the state. But this has been refused. And, and, and basically what the case shows is that um, 
he has not been able to give evidence to his lawyers because he was fearing that these evidence would be um, intercepted by Iranian or Iraqi security services. And what he would normally do and what he actually did in the past was to go to a third safe country in order to instruct his lawyers. But because the borders were shut, he's just stuck in Iraq. And another issue for him in this case is that P3 has very um, important mental, mental health issues and he hasn't been able to access his medicine, again, because of the closing of the borders and because of, because of the COVID pandemic. And these have been taken into consideration by the court in this case. And I think it's the first time that you actually see the effect of the pandemic on a citizenship deprivation case. Thank you very much. More fascinating stuff. Thank you. Um, so turning, um, turning now to, to Christine, would you like to give us your response to that question? Sure. Um, maybe just to follow on from, from Rachel there, um, I was thinking now about some quite practical ways in which I've seen in, in South Africa and neighboring Zimbabwe, um, just access to citizenship claims and documents that you might need have become very difficult for, for many people. So our kind of Department of Home, Affair, uh, Home Affairs kind of offices where one might need to go and get birth certificates, so on and so forth, have just been frequently, frequently closed, either due to the level of lockdown or every time a case is reported there, they would then close for some days. And there's really been many people who've had difficulty accessing what they need. Um, and also in terms of, of visas, things like simple things like a curfew, for example, makes it too difficult for somebody to travel from one Zimbabwean town to another within a day to, to apply for the certain visa they need and, and so on. So in that practical sense, I have seen in day to day just kind of the, the needs one has to live out one's citizenship have become more, more difficult. I think overall, in terms of the, the theory, I haven't... I don't think or I haven't noticed yet the ways in which the nature of the problems of inequality have changed because of the, the pandemic. I think a lot of forms of inequality have been exacerbated in, in many ways. And if we think of something like the, the vaccine, um, I think there is inequality in access to that right to health, but we're going to see that develop into relational inequality when we have certain groups of people much more likely to be vaccinated and have access to certain goods that, that others are not then allowed to have, like travel and, and so on. Um, so maybe to end on my kind of hopeful normative uh, position, I think the best we can hope for is the ways in which kind of global inequality and domestic inequality have been highlighted, as well as kind of the need for collective action might help prompt us to, to do something um, in order to create a a slightly more just regime. I think that's kind of the most hopeful spin on, on the, the situation. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it at, at that. Thank you. Then finally, David, um, I'd be very interested to hear your response to this question. Okay, I mean, can I just, I just start by reminding us that WHO guidelines for pandemics um, explicitly um, do not call cool for closures of borders. And indeed, you know, the Lancet reported that the uh, policy of 167 states um, to fully or partially close borders um, generated very significant problems uh, for treatment of the disease, particularly um, in the global south. It's worth noting as well that at least 57 states um, did not exclude asylum seekers from the closing of borders. So they basically stopped uh, access for people claiming asylum. Uh, refugee resettlement um, was essentially suspended uh, across these periods. So, so when we're talking about kind of citizenship, yes, you know, the pandemic illustrated you know, inequalities within states, particularly actually of the position of non-citizens within uh, um, states. And now with vaccine distribution, we're seeing it illustrate, you know, global inequalities as, as well in terms of, um, you know, which states are getting vaccines first, et cetera. Um, 
But those who do not fit neatly into the state citizenship model, those who are not, not you know, happily contained uh, within that, mo that model, undocumented migrants, re asylum seekers, etc., have in many ways been most kind of dramatically um, impacted. And, and I kind of want, because I don't live in, I'm, I'm not optimistic, um, I will end on a kind of depressing note, um, which is that um, in many ways, the kind of vaccine has seen and has motivated um, increasing uh, border surveillance, increasing appeal to the use of biometric measures to control um, movement of people and has given further impetus to what Eilat Shahar kind of refers to as the shifting border. You know, the border that extends outwards from the state, potentially even on an individualized level, okay, as well as the border extending into the state, generating kind of constitution light zones uh, where rights are not properly protected. I mean, remember in the US, 100 kilometers from uh, the border, you know, internal to the US, which takes up two thirds of the US population is essentially a constitution like zone with respect to the enforcement of, of, of border law within the interior. And I think that, that the pandemic has, if anything, only strengthened those elements within the securitization of borders, which were already a problem. Um, so, you know, that I do not see as, as, as um, ho hopeful, very, really. Joe, can I just follow up for a second for uh, presenting the full, just to present the full um, factual picture. Israel actually has vaccinated um, asylum seekers and um, undocumented, um, uh, undocumented migrants and has even opened centers for vaccination in the neighborhoods of um, undocumented migrants stating that there will be no enforcement there. But what is I think interesting is that it has been justified as needed in order to man out of self interest right so mm -hmm. as needed in order to manage the pandemic or portrayed as kind of the kind of gracious humanita humanitarian act but it wasn't recognized or portrayed as recognized as something that Israel is obliged to do or responsible to do um, or, or, is, uh, or has any duty to do. So it's not that the, 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 within, the, you know, within Israel, this distinction be between citizens and non-citizen is not a clear cut, but I think it, it, it doesn't change the fact that in terms of responsibility and duties, with, res with respect to distributing the vaccine, citizenship still is very central, just to kind of give the full factual picture of what's going on. Th thank you very much. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you to all of you for your responses to those questions and my other questions. I think we've probably reached the point where we can now draw this webinar to a conclusion. And um, I just want to put on record my, uh, my thanks to all of the, the participants, the, uh, the four roundtable speakers, the, the organizers in the, the Robert Schumann Center, especially Valentina Bettin, and all of those who've come along and um, participated and particularly posed questions uh, to us. Uh, so thank you very much. And I hope to see you at a Global, set, global Sit webinar, um, as it were, in this space sometime soon. Thank you. Goodbye.